Hi, I'm Scott Bainbridge, and I'm a physiatrist and a founder of Denver Back Pain Specialists. This is Jackie Bainbridge, a professor of pharmacy at UC Denver, and we're going to demonstrate uh, a typical spine examination, looking at both cervical and lumbar spine, and uh, I generally start with cervical range of motion. I'll have you bend your head forward and I'll have them let me know what they're feeling, any discomfort. For instance, this stresses the disc, may cause interscapular pain, may cause ridiculous symptoms, bend back. And this can also elicit ridiculous symptoms on occasion or more focal facet type symptoms, tilt to the side. Again, we're closing down on facets, narrowing foramina, so it may elicit ipsilateral ridiculous symptoms. And it also tugs at the contralateral nerve roots, so you may elicit contralateral uh, symptoms, radicular symptoms. Now just turn first. Don't, there you go, turn. And turning will, uh, a lot of that comes through C12, so we're stressing that a bit. Turn this way and tilt back, narrowing foramina and may elicit signs this is a Sperling's position, I generally don't push down. It may elicit radicular symptoms, occasionally on the contralateral side, but more commonly ipsilateral. Then I'll get into some of my peripheral nerve testing, and so I'll do Tonell's testing. I'll go from just kind of gently bounce tap along the nerve from distal through the proximal carpal tunnel, Guyen's canal. I'll look uh, from cubital tunnel through the ulnar groove up into the arm a little bit. So looking for Tunnell's responses, palpate over that supinator tunnel, sometimes stress that tunnel by having you supinate against me, twist your wrist. That may elicit symptoms on occasion, distal symptoms. I'll look for evidence of thoracic outlet syndrome. So I'm gonna have you bring your arms way up and back. This is ruse test. And you can do this a little bit. I'm being careful not to tent that ulnar nerve at the elbow by giving too much bend. So I let, let those go. I'm going to have you look to your left. This is Wright's maneuver. I'm feeling the radial pulse. We're turn this way. I'm going to palpate anterior scalene, middle scalene, brachial plexus, pec minor, looking for uh, symptoms. And we'll go from there. And I'm also going to um, take a look at Phelan's. Let's have you bring your elbows up, drop your hands. We're going to hold this a minute. If this elicits tingling, pain, that's a positive Phelan's test. If they do have that positive, I'll let them shake out the symptoms and then bend your elbows all the way up. And again, we're tenting that ulnar nerve looking for ulnar distribution symptoms into the fourth and fifth digits. We do this when we sleep. Sometimes that happens to people at night and relax down. Then I'll get into my reflex exam. I'm using a kind of a real loose whipping type action. I'm tensing the biceps tendon here and I'm striking my thumb. And that's a largely a C5, a little bit C5 and 6 reflex. Brachioradialis. And I'm going to strike my thumb so I don't strike their radial sensory nerve. Relax down. And that's C6. I'm going to compare sides, obviously. Here is C7. So just above the electronon process. Again, a nice whipping action. If you need to relax them, you can just have them jiggle. Sometimes you can do it down here or up in this position. Then I'll go to the lower extremities. Uh, kind of a mixed L234 or L234 patellar. So I just drop down, find that patellar tendon. Nice whipping action. And the Achilles reflex, S1, this is L234. And here I'm going to come from this direction. I'll, for demonstration's sake, I'll come from behind and just a nice bouncing type maneuver looking at that. Now some people do this, I don't often do it, but you can tense the hamstring tendon and you can strike there and get a, an L5 reflex. Then I'll do plantar responses. I'm stroking the lateral sole of the foot across the metatarsal area and looking 
for that normal downward flexion or neutral, if it flares, that's a positive sign of upper motor neuron problems. Also, I'll check for ankle clonus. I'll bounce up like this. If you get two or three bounces, that's normal. If you get four to six abnormal sustained clonus, abs absolutely abnormal upper motor neuron sign. Then I'll turn to sensory testing. And I will, for demonstration purposes, I'll reach across you, Jackie, and start up here in this C4 area along that upper trap area. Come down to the police patch for C5. Come along this radial aspect of the forearm dorsal thumb, or I like to do this vent volar thumb for C6. As you get further along here, you're getting into C7 and C8 on the dorsal side. Again, I do more ventral testing, C6, C7 along the third digit, C8 along the fifth digit, and your median, median ulnar nerves, here I'm going to get up into the medial proximal forearm elbow for T1 and up into the upper medial arm for T2. Then I'll come down into the legs and I often start in this L3 area, distal medial thigh for L3, upper anterior thigh for my L2, up just below that ilioinguinal uh, or inguinal ligament in the crease for L1. L4, a good place where you can be confident it's L4 is at the medial malleolus. L5, we're looking at dorsal foot along that kind of the third ray. And for S1, we're looking at lateral heel. And again, comparing side to side. And I'll have them do a straight leg raise here, bring your feet up towards you, and I'll have them go into a slump seated uh, seating, sitting test. Round your back, tuck your chin, and we're really stretching that dura, looking for that uh, neural uh, tension sign, radiating radicular pain. Relax up, and let's test your strength. So I'll start with the shoulder abductor C5 largely, push up against me. If it's someone really strong, you're going to have trouble breaking that, so I'll extend them, lift up, and again, C5. Go ahead and do this. Now, go ahead and drop this arm, and <clears throat> bicep, C5 and 6, pull, push out against me, tricep, C7, bring the wrist back, and I'm going to have you lock that wrist, hold against me, C6, down here, I'm going to stabilize her here and have her lift your fingers into mine. C7, finger extension. Finger flexion is largely C8. Squeeze as hard as you can, and I'll do both sides at the same time. And spread your fingers, hold out there. And this is largely T1, C8, T1. Uh, you can kind of do that, T1. Now, Abductor pollicis brevis is C8, T1. It's also median nerve. Carpal tunnel is very, syndrome is very common. So I'll check that too. Hold that. And I'm going to come down in this angle. Resist me. And brings out that APB. Relax there. Now I'm going to go to the lower extremities and start with hip flexor testing. Lift up against me. That's an L2 function. You can also see weakness with uh, cervical myelopathy in that area. L3, 4 with some L2 for knee extension. Push out. Pull back. The uh, hamstrings, L4, 5, S1, S2. Bring the feet up at the ankles, a little bit up and in. And testing anterior tibialis, L4 and 5. The only L4... Uh, below there other than some eversion function. Bring the toes up and EHL, largely L5. Now, pure eversion is an L4 function. I don't test it that way. I bring the foot up into dorsiflexion and flare laterally, bringing in those perineals, long toe extensors, 
which get me into an S1 test. So a little different style with that Dorsey E version. And go ahead and step down. I'm going to have Jackie walk on her toes, testing largely S1 strength and her balance and other things, and then walk on your heels way up high, testing L4 and L5. Good. And then I'll have you stand there, heels together, close your eyes. Often I'll have them raise their arms up too. This is Romberg's test, a good test in our setting for proprioception. So, and relax. And I will look at their gait. And so what I often do, go ahead and I'll, I'll go ahead and demonstrate the gaits. So early in myelopathy, people have trouble with quick turning while walking. So I'll have them walk to a destination in the room, turn and walk back, looking for any kind of a little bit of wobbliness as they turn as a sign of possible proprioceptive issues, possible cervical myelopathy. There's a couple other gates that I often look for. One, if there's perineal neuropathy or a dense L4 or L5 radiculopathy, they can't dorsiflex. And so they have to clear their toe by lifting their knee quite high. This is the gate that results, and that's called a steppage gate. Another gate, if for instance with cervical myelopathy, is a spastic gate. Often subtle when they're in my office. We're often early in the diagnostic process, so they may just have a, a vague stiffness of gait. What happens in this scenario is there's a, an extensor overdrive, weakness of the hip flexors, so sometimes you'll even see a circumduction gait and some stiffness. That's brought out even further with faster walking. So if you want to go into the hallway and really test it well. Uh, gates where there is poor sensory feedback, poor proprioception, they tend to be a little wider. People use visual cues. And so they want to see when their feet are touching. If they close their eyes, if they're in the dark, they really can't feel their feet touch. And so they have to almost stomp a stomping gait, so they get that vibration and they know when they're contacting the ground. So I'll look at gait and look for those types of patterns. All right, Jackie, come on back in. And I'll do a standing exam. And so I'm looking at posture. Is it a head forward posture, etc.? I'm going to palpate more along the muscular areas, looking for trigger points, looking for atrophy, that type of thing. I will also then transition down into a lumbar spine exam. If there's any mid-back pain, I'll do some percussion testing and spinous process palpation. Those tend to be positive with compression fractures. I'll look also, look at my crest height, L4-5, and I'll work down the paraspinous areas, looking at muscle tension, looking for focal facet tenderness. When I get to the PSIS, now I'm kind of getting into that SI joint tenderness territory. PSIS down along the SI joint. Sometimes if you ask people to point to where their pain is, they'll point right to that SI joint. That's a positive Fortin finger sign. Then I look at bending forward with my thumbs on the PSIS. So it's a flexion test. If they have midline pain, could be disc related, come on up. When they flex, I'm looking at the PSIS movement. If one moves more, it's a positive standing flexion test, indicative of a locked SI joint. Similarly, I'm gonna have my thumbs on the PSIS and do gelaise testing. Raise your right knee, and that PSIS rolls down as it should. If there was a locked joint, it would not roll down. It might even raise up a little bit. That would be a positive gelaise test for SI joint kinetic problems or uh, pain. Now, this comes straight back. If they complain of midline pain, sometimes a, a posterior disc tear can show up as discogenic midline pain with extension even. 
extend and rotate. This really loads the facet joints. You can have paralumbar pain, contralateral or ipsilateral. I'll do it both directions. If you don't have this pattern of pain with this maneuver, likely not facet related pain. If you do this and they feel it in the buttock or leg down below, then that's probably a radicular pain sign due to probably foraminal stenosis. And so I'll do that. I'll palpate out along the piriformis muscles towards the greater trochanters. I'll locate those, palpate along the backside where the bursa is, where the tendon insertions are, and see how that is as well. All right, then what I'll do is we'll get onto the table in a supine position. So on your back with your head down there. And here I'm going to uh, look at SI joint uh, stress maneuvers, hip stress maneuvers, straight leg raising for neural tension signs. So I will put my palms right inside the ASIS and push down and out. Pelvic distraction, the purpose of that is to kind of stress those SI joints. And if you have uh, SI joint area pain, that's a positive sign. And I'm going to start my straight leg raising and tension along the, the nerve root. Lasegs maneuver accentuates that. And if they have radicular symptoms, that's positive. Then I'll move into Faber or Patrick's test. I'll stabilize the pelvis. Don't want to induce rotation. That'll confuse matters. Let the knee fall. Classically taught with some downward pressure. I'm very gentle with that if I do it at all. And I'm looking for either ipsilateral hip groin pain or SI joint pain on either side. So this is an SI joint and a hip strain maneuver. Bring this up. I'm going to internally rotate, put a little over pressure, IROP testing. This can bring out hip pathology related pain. So in the groin, deep in the hip. And you can do a scour maneuver where you're bringing that femur up against the acetabulum, looking for femoroacetabular impingement. The quadrant maneuver where you're really pushing down, bringing this out, and again, looking, stressing that hip as well. Now, sometimes in the supine position, I'll do my flexion, adduction, internal rotation testing to stretch the piriformis. So I'm going to show you how it's properly done on her side, but I can start that process, see if it elicits pain along the piriformis and if there's any accompanying tenderness. I'm going to have you turn on to your left side. Yep, there. And I'm going to push down on the iliac crest, pelvic compression, again an SI joint stress maneuver. Go ahead and pull that knee up. And I'm going to bring this, actually you can straighten that for now. It might work a little better in you. Bring the roll back and at about 60 degrees, let this down and we're stretching the piriformis again. This time bring your knee up and I'm going to extend and I'm going to stabilize your pelvis so you're up vertically. Pull this back into a neutral position. If the IT band is tight, this is Ober's test. If it's tight, I can let go and it will stay right there. If it's flexible, it will drop down. Don't let it go forward though. So if it stays there, that's a positive Ober's sign. Um, let's do Gainsland's. Now, let's go towards this side of the table. On your back though, just scoot this way. Uh, on your back, go ahead and scoot back, but come towards the edge. So, you're going to bring that knee up, and we're going to drop this off the side. Pull your knee up in deflection, go ahead and grab it. And we're torsioning the pelvis, stressing the SI joints, another SI joint screening maneuver. You would have pain in that area. Go ahead and sit up. And I may sometimes dive into other areas of the exam, shoulder, etc. but this is a good screening exam for the spine. So one optional portion of the exam is a supine 
somewhat of an osteopathic exam. It's not a true full osteopathic exam, but these are elements from that that I borrowed. But anyway, first I'm going to just lift in a plane the head and just a little nodding motion to stress C01. Now I'm going to have you tuck your chin. I'm very cautious in this, in this uh, maneuver. Drop your head. I'm going to tuck just a bit more and I'm tenting this interspinous ligaments and trying to isolate C12 rotation. So if they have focal upper cervical pain, that may be consistent with C12. And now I'm going to palpate up there in that C1 area, looking for tenderness. And then I'm going to drop down to the sides of the facets at C23. And I'm going to just kind of give a little traction flexion Wiggle, looking for tenderness, feeling for spurs, feeling for stiffness of motion. C3, 4, and I kind of walk my way down the spine. And once I get to too much soft tissue or it gets tender along the plexus, I'll dip behind and do a PA glide and palpation over the facets, and I'll walk down into the upper back. Again, looking for focal tenderness, restricted motion, and use that to help me pinpoint which facets to ask therapy, for instance, or a manual therapist to work on, or direct my injection techniques towards. And that's the exam. Thank you.